turn with me to Matthew 28, please. We'll go to a couple parts of Scripture today, but we'll begin there. The critics of Jesus Christ and Christianity and the Bible, one of the things that they do to discredit it is they try to find contradictions in the Bible. And so they study it, actually. They study it and study it and study it, and they study it in modern languages, and they study it in ancient languages. And, and um, at, when I first got saved, I don't know, it's probably a m- mixture of being a man and liking apologetics and f- philosophy, is I wanted to make sure the Bible was true before dedicating my entire life. I, I always believed in Jesus Christ, but... You know, it, does, the, does the Bible really have no errors? Is it infallible and errant <clears throat> and all that uh, Christianity claimed? One of the ways of doing that is um, uh, to look at the very things that the critics tell us are contradictions. Um, and... What really increased my faith, and this was actually the first six months I got saved, I made it a practice to pick a story in the Gospels, and when picking that story in one sitting, you read every Gospel account on that one story. And by the way, there's not one story um, that you can read, or one event, like the Sermon on the Mount, all those, that really takes any longer than 10, 15 minutes reading all of them. And so you pick one and you just read all of it and these critics will find something like when James and John came to Jesus Christ, our Lord, our risen Lord, and they say to him, can we sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand One of the Gospels says that James and John did this, and another Gospel says that James and John's mother asked Jesus Christ, and the critics will look at that and say, see, this is a contradiction. And they don't understand a lot, number one, it's not a contradiction, But they don't understand how to study historical events accurately to to, to, to verify the validity of events. Not just events in the Bible, but historic events all throughout history. And a group of people that really know how to investigate historical events or um, modern day crimes are investigators and detectives. Murder detectives, police officers, law enforcement, military. And they go through training on how to interrogate those whom were there, maybe the very people who committed the crimes. So they sit them down in the room. Now, one of the first things that they do is they'll get a group of people who are involved in the story, uh, possibly complicit in the crime, And they will separate them immediately. They put them in separate rooms. And they begin to interrogate them. They say, what happened? These are the events as we found them. This is the evidence that we have. What happened? And one of the first things that they know if the people involved in the story, after they've been separated, they know they're lying if their stories are word for word. They know they're lying immediately. Why? Because at some point in time, before the crime, after the crime, in the middle of the crime, they say, we got to get our story straight. We got to get our story straight. And so they rehearse it. They memorize it. Okay, you're going to say this, and you're going to say this, and you're going to say this, and I'm going to say the same things. And when investigators hear this, by the way, they know they're lying. The gospel accounts tell the same story 
taking away information and adding information because they were human beings who were telling the story. The accurate story of the events that transpired in Scripture, especially as you compare them in the Gospels, because the Gospels are four different accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And so it's no contradiction at all that uh, one person um, uh, was there and they said, well, no, the, the mother of James and John were there because she did ask. And then another perspective, because another person wrote an, the other gospel, like Luke or, or Mark or, or, or Matthew or John, and they say, no, James and John did it. And the fact of the matter is they both probably did. There's no contradiction at all. But the point is, that the story remains intact even more because they have different information that does not contradict it, each other. And that is this great beauty of the scriptures. I would encourage you, make it a practice. Do it once a week, twice a week. You know, pick a story and just read all of it and it'll enrich your faith and it'll also give you all the information that the Bible wants us to have about that story. The Garden of Gethsemane, is fascinating to me. We study it on Thursday. By the way, our church has Thursday services. Um, you're most welcome. And so um, we, we see that in the garden, it wasn't just 10, 12 men come arrest Jesus as the pictures depict in so many of our children's books and uh, uh, pictures on our Sunday school. And, and it is really in my heart, Lord willing, when we... Uh, build the new church across the street, that the children's ministry will be riddled with drawings, actually, that properly represent the scripture. And in this particular case, in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a couple hundred men, most likely, that came into the garden. Some scholars believe as many as four or five hundred. However, we know it was a hundred or more men, the Bible says in Luke, a cohort, that's a Greek word for a particular battalion, it it's, uh, can be around 200 men as we've studied history, but in Matthew's account it says, a great multitude, a great multitude. Guys, if 10 people come in, we don't call that a great multitude. If all the people in this room come in, we call that a great multitude. So all of you, there may not have been that much, but 100 plus men come into the garden to arrest Jesus Christ. Judas comes. He tells these men, the one who I kiss on the cheek, he's Jesus Christ. They didn't have technology. They don't know what he looks like. And so they come in. Jesus is receiving a kiss from Judas in his infinite grace, he says, friend, why are you here? And then, after Judas does not answer that question, he says, have you come to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And you get this whole dialogue. The resurrection account is the same. We won't go through every one of them. But here in um, Matthew 28, we'll, we'll read it and kind of go along with this one, but I'll, I'll pick from the others. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, rolled back the stone from the door, and sat on it. So this angel is sitting on the stone. I mean, guys, it's good for us to picture that and to see why the very object that is supposed to keep him, the physical object, death was supposed to keep him in there, but the, the very physical object that is supposed to keep this body in this tomb, the angel is sitting on it like it's a leaf of paper, like it's nothing. Isn't that, isn't that imagery so powerful? There is no one ton, two ton, three ton stone, however much it weighed, it was several hundred pounds, several hundred kilos, that, that it was going to stop Jesus Christ from getting out of that tomb. And 
is interesting to see that man thinks they can actually stop God, but they can't, and they won't. And it came and rolled back the stone on the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. I think the angel was wearing this clothes because a Kenyan woman washed it. It's white as snow. You guys ever notice how white you get your clothes? How do you do it? It's a miracle. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said... Notice that. As he said... Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, that you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples word. When they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brethren, go to Galilee and then they will see me there. Now there is a lot more information when you combine all this. For example, the angels, that's not all the conversation they had with these women. The angel said, as I mentioned during uh, our, our praise service, that they said, hey, go tell the disciples and what? And Peter, can you imagine hearing that from these women? They go to the disciples, hey, the tomb is empty. The stone's been rolled away and the body isn't there. And, and, and they're like, what? Yeah, and an angel told us to come tell you guys. These guys are hiding. They are hiding behind closed doors like cowards. Feeble little cowards, and at least you think I'm making fun of them. Let me tell you, without the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, we will all be cowards, men. I don't care how strong you think you are. You will never stand up to men unless you first bow down to Jesus Christ. And so these angels, the ladies are like, the angels told us. They told us. And, and, oh, and Peter, they told us to tell you by name. Can you imagine? Peter's like, what? Say, say again. They, they said by name? They wanted you to tell me by name? And it could have gone one or two ways. Uh-oh. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. I'm condemned. I, I know it. I knew it. I knew it. My sins have come to pay me back. I denied Jesus Christ. I tried to chop off the head. I only got the ear. I, I, I knew it. Or could have Peter been like, wait a minute. I was with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. He was never a harsh master. He was never unkind. In all of my sin, he always forgave me. Could it be? Could it be that he mentioned by me by name? You know what? That sounds like Jesus Christ. Calling out to us. And we go hiding, don't we, church? We sin. We've been brought up in these religions that do the whole punishment for sin. And reward of works, punishment for sin, reward for works. When the first few months I came into Kenya, everybody was debating the statement, God helps those who what? You guys know it. It was going around. There was a preacher off in Nairobi who was on TV saying that. And, and the idea was give money. You go work and you give your money because God's only going to bless you if you give your money. God helps those who... And, 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 I, and I had people come... 
ask me if that was true. And I thought, well, what context? And this, I didn't know this, the, the, what context preachers were saying this in. It's like, well, the context, what is he, is he saying that if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat because that's true and there's, there's a whole dialogue that happens. But, oh, no, 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 that's not what he was saying. This is prosperity gospel nonsense where money becomes the God of men and not Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh, no, wait a minute, because I got to tell you something. I'm glad that God helps those who cannot help myself because I would have nothing if Jesus Christ did not strengthen me and save me and deliver me from my sins. <laughs> Guys, we got to stop running and hiding because Jesus is calling out to us. He's, he, I'm not just saying that as a Christian cliche because I'm saying that because the Bible says he stands at the door. He's knocking. He's come to visit us again and again and again and again and again. I know you've sinned. I know I've sinned. I know there's addictions. I know there's addictions to alcohol. Actually, there's a, let's just say, lust for alcohol. I know there's lust for sexual morality. I know there's bondage to pornography. Even people in this room. He wants to deliver you and you're hiding because you grew up in a religion thinking if you do those things, God is so angry that he's ready to kill you. He's ready to curse you. No, Jesus Christ died on the cross becoming a curse for us so that we do not have to be punished for our sins. Glory, hallelujah. And, and here's the good news. He doesn't want us to continue in sin that grace may abound. And that's good news because sin is very damaging to us. He wants us to be holy because he loves us. He wants us to be righteous because he loves us. And so Peter hears this and can you imagine? He's like, you know, that sounds like Jesus Christ. That sounds like my Lord. That, that sounds like the gracious rabbi my friend, and he ran down to the tomb with John. Now, there's a few points that I would like us to make, like to make today to you, that four points. Number one, these women appear, and men and women, but I'll speak to the men at first, we need to learn a lesson of intimate affection. I'm not trying to um, sound feminine. I'm not a feminine man at all. And I believe femininity in men is wrong. Um, that chick flick mentality, where the lady you know, finally finds the guy that she loves and this is how she describes him. She's like, yes, he's not like other guys. He's sensitive. We connect our emotions, we connect. You just described a woman, ladies, and he's not like other guys. And that's not a good thing. Um, so there's this wrong idea of what a man should be. I guarantee you it is not how Hollywood describes it. The femininity was taken out of men when Eve was taken out of Adam. And then we join masculine and feminine because they're both wonderful. And, they, and, and, and we need both. And we need both in a family. And one of the reasons why there is such femininity in men, unfortunately, around the world is because of fatherlessness. So get, if, single mothers, that's not, don't be discouraged. That's not bad news. Bring your children to Calvary and us men will rough them up and get them masculine. But in this point, it's, it's not an emotion necessarily I'm trying to derive. It's not some sensitivity uh, uh, to, to, to a worldly type secular feeling. But these women love Jesus Christ. And they're going down 
to sacrifice their goods to anoint him, uh, bringing spices and perfumes into the tomb. And they're going by faith. They don't even have the strength, nor do they know how they're going to remove this large rock that is circular, by the way. They would use sticks, but you'd get a couple men on the under, the, uh, 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 of a, a branch and you would remove it like a cantilever. How are these women going to do it? They don't know, but guess what? They love Jesus Christ and they're going by faith. And they're giving of themselves. These women... Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, are an example to us of love and faith. Love and faith. Men, we're goal-oriented. We are goal-oriented. We we want to conquer. We want to build. We want to fight. We want to fly. We want to be mechanics. We, we, We... I must confess, I'm saying this because I'm convicted by this myself. Last night, I stopped drawing plans for the new church at 1 a.m. And I got into bed, and men, do you know when you got something in your mind, like a building you're trying to build, or or pilots, a plane you're trying to fly, mechanics, an engine you're trying to build, uh, uh, um, masons, a wall you're trying to erect, and you're designing it. And guys, I didn't go to bed till 3.30. I'm just sitting there. I had to start praying. I had to start repenting of idolatry. I mean that. It's like, I, if I, you, I don't stay up till 3.30 praying usually. And I'm designing some building that's going to burn one day to the ground. And I was like, Lord, help me sleep. I, I need sleep, Lord. Calm my heart and... And guess what happened when I started to pray? Intimacy. I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to conquer. I, I, I'm not going to figure this out tonight. I, Lord, I, I need you to, to come. And, and that's what these women are all about. And men, I'm not trying to say we need to act like women or talk like women. N- none of that. We, we shouldn't do that. But what I am saying is that we need to have an intimacy with Jesus Christ. And we need to stop every now and again. In fact, very often, we just get alone and say, Lord, I'm a weak man. I can't do this without you. I can't do that without you. I I need you. And we need to become vulnerable to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Think about it. These disciples were ready to conquer. They were ready to conquer, guys. Oh, we'll never betray you. We'll never deny you. We will go with you to the end. And then Peter, that guy. And guys, who can relate to Peter more than they can to the Apostle Paul? Just me and G. You're all liars. Every one of you men. I, uh, guys, I am worse than Peter. I want you to know. But Peter, can you imagine? He's like, hey, all of these losers will deny you. But I will not. Even if they deny you, I won't. I mean, I can see how Matthew's going to deny you. He, he's, been, he's been going to the front of the food line for three years. <laughs> you know, all this stuff. It's just... And they have an army come out. And guys, you got to give it to Peter. There's 100, 200 men standing before Jesus and 11 disciples... They're trained military men. They know how to use a sword. Peter takes his sword out and he's like, off with your head. And he gets the ear. Do you know how embarrassing that is, men? Now, I don't know what this is like for a sword, but we shoot guns in America because it's awesome. And every nation should have the right to bear arms. So that's just a side note there. But we shoot guns. And us, me and my friends will go out and we'll shoot guns. And guys, men, we can't go shoot guns without having a competition, right? 
And all of this nonsense, which is a femininity of competition is wrong and, and there's no first place. There's no first place. You guys heard of this movement in the West? It's not in Africa, thank God. But it's probably coming. It's like we don't give first place trophies out to children because the children shouldn't be made to feel inferior if he gets third, fourth, fifth, or sixth place. Let me tell you something. I play games with my kids all the time and I never let them win. <laughs> never. Uh, that's not true. I've let them win a couple times but because I have two girls, but especially my son, I never let him win because he needs to learn how to get better. And you get better with playing with people who are better than you. We go and we shoot these guns, guys, and we have these competitions. And, and, and shooting rifles are a lot easier, especially if you have a scope. You can shoot a rifle very far away. Guys, you could go out into the field behind that apartment complex, and I could probably kill you. I don't want to um, for most of you, but <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't want to kill any of you. But handguns are really hard. You have to get... You have to get a lot of training and practice to be proficient with a handgun. And even from here to this wall, good 15, 20 feet, if you get a, 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 a chart with a bullseye in the middle, guys, you'd be shocked how many of you will not hit that bullseye just at 20 feet. And we go out with my friends. and my fr I've lived in Africa for like 13 years. So these guys... They're like hitting, they're marksmen, and I can barely even hit the piece of paper on the tree. It's embarrassing. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is for Peter? He's not 20 feet away or 1,000 yards away. He's got a sword. He's right next to this guy, and the only thing he manages to cut off is the ear. Humiliation. Why? Because he's operating under his own strength. And now he's hiding like a coward. Because men, we are cowards without God. I don't care how brave you look. And he is no longer doing what these women are doing in an intimacy with, with Christ. He, he was using Christ for the wrong reasons. He wanted to conquer. Jesus Christ wanted him to worship at his feet. Which is the second point. You notice it says in the text we read today that they worshipped him grabbing at his feet. Verse 9, so they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Here is the reality. Here is a key to resurrection life. You want to know what resurrection life... It's simple. Jesus Christ is God. He came as a man. He lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins because we're guilty and we're sinful and we're wicked and we need a Savior and we need forgiveness. He was buried into him. He rose again. And guys, you're supposed to rise again unto repentance to walk away from sin. You're supposed to. And it begins with, is he Lord or isn't he? Is he boss? Is he king? See Alpha and the Omega. Is he the one who now you've begun a relationship with and you don't get to, 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 to accomplish your will? You don't get to set your plans. You get to report for duty every single day. Christ, I report for duty. And there's no better way to do that. And there's really no way to do that without humility. Getting down. Oh, it is right that they are on their face, grabbing at his feet and worshiping him. Guys, this is not some primitive tribal group of people out in the woods who are worshiping some false god. This is a sophisticated people. Who, look, who are humiliating themselves by grasping at Jesus Christ's feet. And I, I, I got to tell you, 
it gets me so excited to think that I could have been there with them and I prayed to God that I was laying down on the ground having at his feet and worshiping him. That's where I want to be. Think of the humility of it. It's so undignified, isn't it? You know, I have this thing. I have this thing. In my house, we have a lot of people all the time. What bugs me more than anything in the house is if my bedroom door stays open and as people walk by my bedroom, they can see me laying down on my bed. It's a vulnerable position. I don't like when people see me laying down. In fact, it's very rare. I was sick. I I can only think of one time I laid down in church in front of people. And it was actually last week. I was feeling very sick. We had the camera platform back there. And I just kind of laid down on my back to get about five minutes of sleep. (laughs) Somebody came up to me and woke me up. They're like, can I ask you a question? (laughs) Can I finish my nap first? I didn't say that. It's humiliating. If you're unwilling to humiliate yourself for the worship of Jesus Christ, you have never come into a deep intimacy with him. Think of this. It looks so humiliating, doesn't it? it? It feels uncomfortable when I do this in front of you. It feels odd. But they're not just on their knees. They're doing this. And they're grabbing at his feet. You just thought less of me seeing me do that. It's odd. It's, uh, they're, they're, usually I don't have a lot of emotions when I'm preaching. Just now I felt very weird. When it comes to Jesus Christ, I want to be on my face worshiping him. And I promise you guys... I get these questions all the time. Wow, seems like God is distant. It seems like I'm cursed. It it, it, it seems like that he doesn't hear my prayers. Why is my life so painful? I hate my life. I hate what's happened. And, And there's bad things. And I know there's pain. I know it. And they just don't understand why they can't come out of it. Let me tell you something. Here's the answer to all of those questions. Is he there? Is my life, I feel cursed. This, are you getting on your face before the king and worshiping him in humility? Because he will never pick you up unless first you got down. We gotta humble ourselves before the only person who is worthy of worship. We have to. And after we begin this intimacy with him and we're on our face before him, thirdly, we have joy. We rejoice. Jesus Christ says, rejoice in verse 9. And they held him at the feet and Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren and go to Galilee and there you will see me. Christians, we got to have joy. And our joy is because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in the resurrection. I mean, guys, if you're going to your workplace with no joy and you call yourself a Christian and you look like this, don't tell them you come to Calvary, please. You know, good doctrine causes us to have great joy. And the doctrine of the the resurrection is supposed to produce in us this incredible joy. No matter what our outward circumstances are, it cannot affect our inward joy because Jesus Christ is eternal and in his eternality and his immutability, he's never changing, he's ever existing, we know that we will rise up out of this world one day with new bodies because he rose up out of the tomb and the grave. That's what we know. That, you know what that means? That means getting old 
is not so bad because you have the joy that one day you're going to get a new knee and a new hip. (laughs) And this one will never fade away. It's like, man. And I I know I'm not that age. I'm sorry. I looked over at my friend G. He... He's had some back troubles. It, uh, my, my mother-in-law, she had two, re, two new hip replacements. And, and you know what? For Christians, they're like, you know what? This hip, it's temporary. I'm going to get a new one. And this physician will give me this hip for eternity, and it'll be like the first day I got it. We got joy. We have joy because of the resurrection. And we have hope because of the resurrection. He says in 1 Corinthians, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some amongst you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ from the dead whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. He's being now sarcastic. Oh, if the dead do not rise, then how did Christ rise from the dead? For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. If this, in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men of most pitiable. In other words, if we have hope in Christ in this life, and Christ has not risen from the the dead, then our faith in Christ means nothing. It it, it means nothing to worship a dead God. It means nothing to worship a dead prophet, by the way. But our sins are forgiven. And we will rise again one day. So we have, and the worship team, please come up. We have intimacy with God. God. Because we are bowing at his feet and prostrating ourselves out to worship him. And because of this great intimacy, because of the resurrection, we have this uh, uh, God that is worthy of uh, uh, us humbling ourselves. And we have joy and we have hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's incredible. Now listen, guys. Going back to looking at this study, you look at um, Luke, his gospel, and you know what the angel said to the women? Well, he's risen from the dead. Go tell the disciples, um, go tell Peter, hey, don't you remember when Jesus Christ said he was going to do this? Do you know the angel said that to these women? Do you remember when he was with you, he said he must suffer, be buried, and rise again? How often do we forget about the resurrection? I would encourage you to remind yourself of it daily, hourly. Christ is a live church. He hears us, he sees us this morning, and he is alive. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to give the opportunity for those who are not born again to be born again today. You do not have that intimacy maybe with Jesus Christ. You've not really bowed at his feet and worshiped him. Or you're backslidden. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Father, I pray you would pour out your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, help us. Help those who are not walking with you today to receive you now. Help them, Lord, to rise again in this life, unto holiness, unto righteousness, and into a relationship with you. If you're sitting there today empty, without God, backslidden, and on this Resurrection Sunday of 2024, you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ or to continue that relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you just to raise your hand right where you sit, and I'm going to pray for you right now. Just raise your hand And I will pray for you. Yes. Anyone else? You want to receive the Lord? Raise your hand. Make it a day that you're receiving him. Anyone else? I want to pray for you. And and keep those hands raised, guys. Raise them for Jesus. Don't raise them halfway. Raise them all the way for, 
your new king. Lord, I pray for these who've raised their hand right now. Public statement, Lord. They want you because you're worthy, because you died on the cross for their sins and you rose again from the dead, giving them life. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all these raising their hands now, Lord. Save them from their sins and show them how beautiful and magnificent you are. You're calling out to them like you called out to Peter. Bless them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now keep your hands raised, guys, really high. Church, you recognize all these who's raised their hands. You can put your hands down. Please, if you raise your hands, come get prayer. Go to the Connect Station. Sign up as a new believer. We want to call you this week. We want to talk to you on the phone. We want to give you a Bible. We want to give you uh, resources. And we love you so much.